Today I want to tell you a story that may seem small, almost technical, but in reality, it says a lot about the Linux world, about the dynamics of free software, and about the importance of historical distributions. We're talking about Debian's recent decision to reject a change proposed by the System D project, a modification that violated the file system hierarchy standard. And maybe right now, some of you are wondering, why should we care about an issue involving a folder, some permissions, and a few rules about how the file system is organized? The answer is simple, because it's not just about a folder. It's about power, balance, and identity within the Linux ecosystem. System D is today one of the most influential projects in the entire free software world. Born as an init system, it has grown into a platform that manages processes, logging, networking, C groups, and much more. In other words, System D has taken a central role, and it's practically impossible to use a modern distribution without dealing with it. Personally, I find it hard to accept the idea of using such an invasive, almost tyrannical init system one that intertwines with the modules of major desktop environments until it becomes omnipresent. Its massive adoption, paradoxically, prevents the birth of real alternatives. And this goes against several principles, both the technical ones that form the foundation of Unix philosophy and the ideological ones that represent the heart of free software. This centralization has led to fierce criticism because for many, not just for me, System D is not just a piece of software. It has become a symbol of centralization and a break from the idea of a modular and composable Linux. The issue we're talking about today concerns specifically the Thavar lock directory. According to the file system hierarchy standard, that folder is meant to contain so-called lock files, temporary files used by different applications to coordinate and avoid conflicts. The historical rule is that slash var lock should have very permissive access rights so that different programs can write their temporary files freely. System D in its latest version decided to change those permissions to make them stricter. For systems developers, this might have looked like a security improvement or an optimization, but in practice, it broke a long-standing standard and risked causing huge incompatibilities with existing software. And that's where Debian stepped in. The Debian Technical Committee reviewed the proposal and clearly said, no, we cannot allow systemd to change the permissions of slash var lock in a way that breaks the functionality of long-established historical packages. Debian requested that systemd provide that directory with the correct permissions, those defined by the standard, to guarantee compatibility with Debian's vast ecosystem of packages. It was an intervention born not from pride or hostility towards systemd, but from responsibility. Debian simply cannot allow an external project to introduce a change that could undermine the stability of thousands of applications that users depend on every day. This decision carries a meaning that goes beyond the technical. It's a political signal. Debian is saying, just because systemd has become omnipresent doesn't mean it can impose its choices on the entire ecosystem. There are shared rules, like the file system hierarchy standard, and there are distributions with the weight and credibility to say enough when someone overreaches. And this reminds us that major historical distributions are not just passive users that accept whatever comes from above, they are still key players in shaping the evolution of Linux. Think about it. Today Debian is the foundation of dozens, maybe hundreds of other distributions. Ubuntu, Linux Mint, MX Linux, Debian, just to name a few. Every technical decision made by Debian cascades down through a massive portion of the Linux world. If Debian blindly accepted everything system dictates, we'd find ourselves in an increasingly centralized ecosystem. But the fact that Debian stands up and demands respect for standards is an act of balance. It's as if Debian were saying, System D is useful, it's important, but it's not the master of the house. Some might say Debian is slowing progress, that blocking a change from System D means holding back evolution. I disagree. Because progress doesn't mean rushing forward while destroying what came before. Progress, especially in an open, collaborative system like Linux, means innovating without breaking unnecessarily. It means finding compromises that allow everyone to work and build. And in this case, Debian didn't say System D can't innovate. It simply said, innovate, but without violating the standards that guarantee compatibility and stability. 
Let's look at it from another angle. Why do standards exist at all? Why do we need documents like the FHS that define what belongs in SHEETC, what goes in SHUSR, and what goes in VAR? The answer is simple. Without standards, everyone would do as they please. That might work in a small lab, but not in an operating system that runs on millions of servers, desktops, and embedded devices. Standards are what make collaboration possible between different projects. They're the rules of the game. And those who break the rules risk making the entire ecosystem collapse. Now, I'm not saying system D acts in bad faith. Often its decisions come from good intentions, improving security, simplifying management, unifying behaviors, but when these choices are imposed without considering the domino effect, someone needs to say stop. And that's where Debian shows its importance. Not as a hipster distribution, not as a derivative of someone else's work, but as an institution of the Linux world. A community with decades of history, clear rules, and democratic processes. A community that still has the courage to say no. Honestly, I don't know what would have happened if Debian had decided not to accept System D. Perhaps the goal was precisely to avoid being left out of the ecosystem and instead to remain within it, acting as a positive catalyst against questionable choices. Maybe I'm being too optimistic, but I like to think that's exactly the case. This episode also reminds us of something else. In free software, power is never absolute. Not even System D, with all its influence, can impose everything on everyone. There's a balance of forces. There are communities that make their voices heard. There are developers who aren't afraid to challenge questionable decisions. And that is the true strength of open source. There's no single master. There are many voices, many communities, many actors who check and balance each other. Think of what would have happened if Debian had stayed silent. We'd be talking about broken packages, malfunctioning applications, and users forced to find complicated workarounds. Instead, Debian prevented all of that. And it's not the first time. Throughout its history, Debian has often taken strong stands on both technical and ethical issues. Sometimes those decisions were criticized. Sometimes they slowed down the adoption of new technologies. But almost always, they aimed at coherence, stability, and transparency. In a world where everyone seems to chase hype, where every project tries to present itself as revolutionary and indispensable, Debian choosing the path of prudence is an act of responsibility. And it's also a clear message. Trends fade, projects come and go, but historical distributions like Debian remain and continue to set the pace. So maybe we should stop seeing Debian as just a serious or boring distribution. We should recognize its role as a counterbalance, as a guardian of standards, as a community that still believes in the value of consensus and shared rules. Debian isn't perfect, and it's not the only distribution with political weight, but it's a cornerstone and episodes like this prove it. The lesson we can take away is that free software doesn't need masters. It needs strong, conscious communities. Innovation is vital, but innovation without rules is not progress. It's chaos. And even in 2025, in a world dominated by gigantic projects like Systemd, historical distributions still have a voice that matters, a voice worth listening to. As for Systemd in general, thank God there are still distributions that choose not to use it. One of them is Void Linux, and I keep saying it, it's a little gem. It deserves far more attention and hype than so many flashy projects without vision, consistency, or substance, bloated and narcissistic. Void carries forward a philosophy of simplicity, essentiality, and efficiency with a rolling release model that, in my view, remains unbeatable. And above all, it does so without System D. It's living proof that alternatives exist, that they work, that they're reliable, and that they can be used even as production bases. A real demonstration that, in the Linux world, freedom isn't just a concept. It's something we can still live and choose every single day.